Hey everyone, this is Vacation Nick, and just because I'm all sunburnt and crispy doesn't mean you're not getting your usual dose of Linux and open source news. So this week we have yet another nightmarish Google project, which is basically trying to implement DRM, but for websites. We also have Plasma 6 removing features compared to Plasma 5.27, and we have a new windowing management system in the works for GNOME. And it's short to divide the community, but spoiler alert, I think it looks fantastic. And we also have a bunch of Linux drivers related news and a lot more. So let's dive in right after I tell you about our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Safings Portmaster. Portmaster is an all-in-one tool to easily take your privacy to the next level. And it's a tool I use myself on all of my Linux devices. Portmaster lets you automatically block all trackers and malware in every application you run on your computer. Not just your web browser, but everything you run. It's easy to use with defaults already in place that lets you just set it and forget it. But if you like to configure every rule and every app, you also can. Portmaster is completely free and open source and also free of charge as it's funded by users that subscribe to the SPN, a super powered VPN that gives you multiple identities for every connection of every application. So if you want to easily improve the privacy of your system, whatever the Linux distro you use or even on Windows, click the link in the description below and download the Portmaster for free. So Google has yet another plan to try and make the web worse for everyone. With their web environment integrity feature, they're basically trying to add DRM to the entire web. With this thing, websites could require a token to check if the computer that the website runs on is trustworthy and if the browser session is legit. And if not, they could deny access to the computer and the browser entirely. The stated goal is to increase security on the web, but the end result would be that websites could refuse to grant access to specific operating systems or web browsers to entirely block any computer running adblock, pihole, or something like that, or even to prevent certain extensions to work. The token could also probably be used to identify people specifically and probably serve them with targeted ads. So basically, with this thing, you could kiss your custom Android ROM goodbye, your rooted Android phone goodbye, some Linux distros that aren't owned by companies, or even some alternative web browsers. Any new browser would probably not be trusted by most websites by default, and alternative installation methods for browsers would probably also not be trusted, only the store versions would be. For Linux users, maybe this means only browsers from Flathub or from the Snap Store would be allowed and would be considered unaltered. Or maybe no Linux distro would have a trustworthy token that websites would accept. And even if most of the web decided to not implement this system, if just Google starts using it on their own websites, they could decide that Chrome and Chrome-based browsers are the only ones trustworthy enough, which would basically spell the doom of anything else. We don't know yet if this is just a side project from a Google engineer or a full standard Google wants to push, but the latter is the most likely of the two. Fortunately, as Vivaldi points out in a blog post, the EU would probably flat out refuse this system as it would give companies way too much control over the whole web. Now, at first, this thing did not look too bad to me, but after looking into it, it just feels like a complete nightmare. DRM for the web, where the websites decide who can access them with what tools, what operating systems or what browsers is not ethical and it's not how the web should work or has ever worked. So this thing should be fought tooth and nail to make sure that it is never used by anyone. Now there are changes coming to GNOME's window management. Well, optional changes. Floating Windows is, for now, the default on GNOME, with some edge tiling added to make sorting through Windows easier and virtual desktops to clean up the desktop. In a future version of GNOME, they want to provide a new default system for window management. Basically, each application could just declare its minimum size, its maximum size, and its preferred size. And that's the size the window would occupy, automatically resizing as more windows would be opened. For example, when you open a web browser, it could be maximized immediately. 
but a weather app would only occupy a small portion of the screen. And as you would open more windows, everything would resize or move to another desktop entirely if the display space isn't enough to accommodate it. Windows could also auto-tile if that's the most efficient use of desktop space. Now, of course, don't worry, manual tiling would still be a thing and you could still resize windows and keep them floating at all times, but the default new behavior, titled Mosaic, would have a simple goal. Try to prevent windows from overlapping too much so you don't have to move windows around all the time to get to what you're trying to do. Tiling zones would even be splittable by just dropping a window on top of a tiled window to create more zones. And in usual GNOME fashion, they want to do some user research to confirm that this would work for users. And they would like to work on an extension that implements some of the mosaic principles so they can get some actual user testing. It is not planned for GNOME 45, it's more like 46 or later. And honestly, I think it looks really, really cool. I'm sure a lot of people would disable it by default, but I personally would use it if it's done well enough. It's basically like auto-tiling, but for floating windows. And it basically means you never really have to think about where you're positioning your windows, how much you're resizing them, moving them around using Alt-Tab. I think it's cool. It's kind of like what Apple tried to do with Stage Manager, but actually useful instead of being detrimental. Now, as KDE developers talk about Plasma 6 and what it will bring, it will also apparently drop some features from KDE 5.27. The first one is K-Hotkeys, which is some global shortcut system that was apparently very buggy, didn't work with Wayland, and used some non-standard ways of storing data and configurations, which could result in data loss. The code was also apparently abandoned for a while, so it won't make the cut to Plasma 6. It is replaced with a newer system called K-Global Axel, but users will lose the ability to create their own mouse gestures though. Widgets also will not behave like Windows anymore and won't be able to be minimized, and some methods to force fonts DPI and icon sizes will be removed as well because they're duplicate of other ways of adjusting for a specific resolution and they're sort of confusing for users. Some of the less used task switcher layouts like grid, informative, small icons, text only and thumbnails will also be removed. And the Air Plasma style also won't make the cut as it's abandoned. Per activity power settings will also not be there anymore in Plasma 6 as well as the icon view in the system settings app and Plasma styles will no longer be able to override the general icon theme. All the icons in your widgets and plasma panels will all come from the main icon theme. The Unsplash picture of the day is also gone, not because developers don't want to keep it, but because of a licensing problem. So basically, they're removing stuff that was either confusing, unmaintained, or very buggy, and I'm sure a lot of people were using some of these features. For me personally, the per activity power profiles was kind of useful, but in the end, if it makes the experience better for everyone, less loaded with options and less confusing, I think it's a good thing. I reported previously on Canonical's takeover of the Linux Container Daemon project, but it looks like the makers of Ubuntu don't just want to repatriate the code under their own GitHub repo. They also want to keep complete control over who has access to maintain that project. For example, Christian Browner is a former Canonical employee and an LXD developer, and he has been removed as a maintainer for the project following the transfer of the code to Canonical's GitHub repo. Stefan Graber, the project lead for LXD, also had their rights removed after they left Canonical. So yeah, Ubuntu and Canonical definitely just want to have complete control over that project and they won't accept anyone with maintainer rights outside of the company. It's not exactly how free and open source software is supposed to work, but sure, it's not like we're not used to companies just not giving a crap about the principles of free software and collaboration. Now, seriously, what is up with companies and free and open source software these days? Sure, they follow the letter of the licenses and open source, but they definitely don't follow the spirit which is being trampled into the mud. Now, after the first free and open source NVIDIA drivers for OpenGL landed in Mesa last week, 
The first bits of the Vulcan driver, NVK, are also gearing up to be added to Mesa. It still depends on the nouveau DRM driver, like the previous OpenGL driver, so it's not completely functional until Nuvo gets support for changing the GPU clock speeds on the fly. But it is still a nice big step towards a full, fast implementation of an NVIDIA driver. The NVK driver is built by people from Collabora and Red Hat and the general open source community, and they submitted a merge request for Mesa 23.3. They say it is not currently on par with the current RADV driver for AMD GPUs, but they also say that they have a solid set of features, with Vulkan 1.2 support being around the corner, plus most of what's needed to support DXVK, VKD3D, and Zinc. This driver depends on a nouveau API for the Linux kernel that isn't merged just yet, but is apparently almost ready, maybe for the Linux kernel 6.6. So basically, I would say that at the end of the year, we'll have inside of Mesa, available for everyone without a third-party install, a fully functioning driver that supports Vulkan and OpenGL for most NVIDIA GPUs. It probably won't be on par with the performance of the proprietary driver, but at least it will give you a functional system out of the box. And I would say that 2024 will probably be the year where you could actually use an NVIDIA GPU just as easily as an AMD GPU without even thinking of installing the proprietary driver. And we have yet more good news for Linux drivers. First, there's a new proposed patch that would allow to trigger CPU boosting on a per policy basis, which means that just one logical core or a set of a few cores could turbo boost while the other cores would stay in a non-boosted state. This would deliver good performance without boosting the whole CPU, thus saving more battery life on laptops and generally being more energy efficient. And on the back of the previous Intel Arc 10% speed boost that I talked about last week, we have yet another optimization in Mesa 23.3, which should grant about 10% more FPS in CSGO compared to the drivers that already include the 10% boost I talked about last week. And it gives much better scores in Vulkan benchmarks as well, which should translate in better in-game performance for Arc GPU users. That's a lot of good and important work on these drivers. If we can get a better battery life on all Linux laptops thanks to these adjustments to turbo boosting, and if Intel GPUs, whether they're Arc or integrated, can also deliver more performance with the same overhead and energy usage, then it's just awesome. Okay, let's finish this with the gaming news. So first, some good news for us Linux gamers that usually rely on Steam. Blizzard games are apparently coming to Steam now, starting with Overwatch 2, which is arguably not an outstanding title. You will still be able to use Battle.net, of course, if you prefer, but in the future, we might not have to deal with Lutris or any other third-party launcher to run Diablo 4 or other Blizzard titles. We'll just be able to start them from Steam on the Steam Deck or our Linux PCs with full Proton integration and no hoops to jump through. Does anyone remember the good old days where you could actually buy a physical copy of a PC game and not have to rely on any sort of stupid launcher? I even remember when Steam was introduced and everybody hated it because it made playing Counter-Strike way harder than it should have been. And speaking of launchers, Heroic now has a new update, version 2.9, which now supports Amazon Games. Not to be mistaken for Luna, their game streaming service. Amazon Games is something you get with Amazon Prime that gives you free games each month and in-game content as well. On top of that, the Heroic update adds playtime tracking for GOG games and fixes a bunch of stuff for running games from Epic Games and GOG. And I was today years old when I learned about Amazon Games. I've been an Amazon Prime subscriber for a while for some of their TV shows, but yeah, I never even knew I could have access to some of their free games, so cool. Cool, just like our sponsors Linux PCs. If you've ever bought a computer shipping with Windows out of the box and tried to retrofit Linux on it to notice that, yeah, it doesn't work properly in every single aspect, well, I've got a solution. Click the link in the description below and buy something from Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux pre-installed. All the components in their devices are picked specifically because they're compatible with Linux and will run super well under Linux. 
And they have a huge range of devices that will cover every need and every price point, whether you want a laptop, a desktop, something for work, for gaming, workstation, they have it all. They're all super customizable. All the laptops are openable, repairable, and upgradable, and they ship to most countries in the world. So if you want a good Linux experience the next time you purchase a computer, click the link in the description instead. Don't buy something that supports Windows. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, well, you can always dislike it and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of links in the description below for LibraPay, PayPal, Patreon, YouTube thanks, YouTube memberships. You know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.